Hi guys, uh, I noticed on our Facebook group for students that somebody had taken an interest in a presentation uh, that I did along with Stuart back back last year to uh, a Scottish group of instructors. Um, we were fortunate enough to also have uh, a guy called Willie Davison uh, who uh, attended the meeting as well, who's basically the, the top um, enforcement officer or manager, uh, basically for the whole of the North of England and Scotland, anything above uh, York really falls under his jurisdiction and it's his responsibility to actually, um, if you like, train the um, examiners and make sure the examiners keep to the appropriate standard, both for part three and also for standard check. So obviously he was a really useful guy to, 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 to be contacted with and it gave us opportunity to, to explore with him um, exactly how we operate and and how they would view it from their perspective, especially now they were focusing on this new shorter test where they really want you on the move as much as possible um, rather than stationary. So um, with that in mind, I thought it might be useful to, to go through the slides again. Um, I have slightly modified them since last year um, and actually show you what our thinking was behind that and what conclusions we'd actually drawn about how we might need to go about this shorter shorter test. And uh, so hopefully it'll be useful to, to you who are training as, as PDIs, which is primarily why I'm, I'm doing, it, uh, doing it now. So let's start by sharing the screen. A little bit, look, this will work perfectly. Let's see if it does. Come on, share. And away we go. There we go. Hopefully everybody can see the screen now. So, um, adapting to the new short part three and standards check tests with what we do currently. So what we started off by doing is looking at what the DVSA said about this. The, uh, when, when this shorter test, when they decided the shorter part three test, which originally came in for COVID, uh, when they announced that they were now going to do that permanently, this is basically the notice that they put out. These are the points that they, they made to us at the time. First of all, I, as you can see, it says that the part three and status check will remain at 45 minutes long. Um, they believe it, sh it was shown to be enough time to properly demonstrate all of the required competencies and the appropriate instructional techniques. Um, no evidence to support it will in in uh, uh, resulting detriment to the standards was found and examiner's feedback confirmed the shorter period had led to a more focused assessment from their perspective. Uh, learners must be at the part of train stage to avoid the need for stationary instruction so as to assess the instructor's ability to control the lesson in a moving environment. So that was the reason given and the notice presented by the DVSA last year as to why they were going to keep to this shorter test. So how is that likely to affect us? That's what we were really looking at last year. What do we think that would mean, uh, uh, mean for us? Um, for example, do we need to prepare a slightly different kind of lesson for the test? What form should it take? And who should we take with us? Well, clearly, if you're gonna be doing the lessons around the test center, then it is going to affect the way in which you would, um, uh, you know, develop your lesson, or in fact, the way you would actually uh, plan your lesson uh, completely. So that's uh, an, uh, an important aspect to consider uh, when you're looking at actually um, doing a lesson from the driving from the test centre. Uh, do we need to review how we structure or conduct lessons once our students reach the pilot train stage, so as to avoid or minimise? being stationary. So do we need to try to do more of the lessons on the move, minimizing the need uh, to be stationary in preparation for this particular uh, part three test or standards check? That's really what that question is asking you. And especially because of uh, our emphasis on non-directive learning strategies, such as coaching and structured experiences, if you like, learning through the experience, discovery, learning, and reflection, should we be um, less, uh, uh, not encouraging that as much 
um, in favour of more directive teaching strategies, such as instructional support stroke intervention, which can be partial, full, prompted, Q&A, and on, uh, unaided. In other words, transfer of responsibility if it's used as a, a teaching mechanism or if it's used for intervention is to help avoid or prevent faults from happening. Um, uh, and the old core competencies process, see, say, associate, associate, do we need to be pushing that much more strongly than the non-directed learning strategies of coaching? So that's the question that we have to ask ourselves. Uh, and, and that's something that partly is answered by um, what happened talking to the instructors uh, up in Scotland um, and talking to other Davis. So have we moved, in other words, have we moved too far to the non-directive approach, especially in how we train new PDIs? Um, because, you know, with all the best will in the world, uh, new PDIs are not going to be necessarily be experts at coaching. So um, this is what we think. This is uh, basically what came out as well to some degree from that, from that, that meeting that I had with Stuart and the, the Scottish guys. Um, the PDI ADI should consider starting a lesson with a learner well before they arrive at the tensor, test centre. Everybody was in agreement with that as being a sensible thing to do. Uh, that way you can get you can do all the normal things you do with the LD system, map the workbook, go through the reflections, you know, look at what um, what uh, goals you've got for the lesson, look at the the outline plan and so on, well before you actually uh, meet with the examiner. And that's obviously going to save time and you're going to basically um, hit the floor running, if you like, because um, you, you may well be, you know, 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes into the lesson by the time you actually get to the uh, 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 test centre to pick up the examiner. Therefore, the lesson beginning phase could be completed with some lesson development already started by the time you arrive at the test centre, ready to meet the examiner. Just before you meet the examiner, we would, uh, again, it was suggested that we would review progress up to that point and agree with the learner what to do next. This is even before you meet, meet the examiner. So whether you do this in the, you know, uh, in the car park before the examiner, uh, you meet with the actual examiner is, is the idea around that. The examiner will no doubt require to know a little bit about the PDI's development so far, and particularly he'll ask you how many hours it's done. And the purpose for that is that the way the examiners mark the forms is they try to assess whether the, the learner is what call, what they call partly trained, trained, full license holder or full license holder experience. Because depending upon which category the learner fits into, will to some degree expect, uh, will uh, the examiner will expect a certain level of support and help to be given to them. So if he's a partly trained, then that they, in fact, it says in the standards um, that they produce the ADI examiner guide that it's unrealistic to expect a partly trained person to be able to do something right the first time without support. So if it falls into a partly trained category, which is probably anybody under 20 hours, um, then do bear that in mind. The examiner will be expecting you to give them support. He won't be expecting you to let them, um, you know, uh, do it without any support on, on the first attempt to at anything that's new. Um, on the train side, that is similar, but you now have to be careful that if you do too much of that support, then it might be classed as, as what's called over instruction. The previous thing I was mentioning, if you didn't give enough support, will be classed as under instruction. Um, so they're, they're, that's the main thing. And same with a full license holder, they're obviously going to expect them, you to do less support and more interaction and more Q&A really rather than telling the person what they do or what they should be doing um, that you, they should be, you should be getting that out of them instead of putting the learning in and trying to get the learning out in other words and, but especially for the full license holder and the full license holder experience. Um, it, the examiner will also want to see your skills development workbook to see how much training you've been receiving, especially, obviously, if you're a PDI, not if you're an ADI, but if you're a PDI, you're not a part three, that they will want to have a brief look at that, possibly. Um, or you might just need to say, look, it's here, and they'll say, fine, I've seen it, thank you, I can tick the box to say that you've had it. They will ask you 
uh, whether your trainer was audit or not. Uh, in most cases, you'd be able to say yes. Uh, this would then lead on to the, the PDI, ADI, giving a short brief. So what we'd recommend then is that you as a PDI or ADI would give a short brief, two or three minutes, on what had happened so far in the lesson today. Um, then going on to what you plan to do next um, and finally checking whether the examiner uh, had any queries before proceeding with the next chunk of learning or the next learning step or whatever terminology you prefer to use. Um, expressing precisely to the examiner what the learning goal of the next step is or indeed the learning need that you've identified which you're uh, trying to um, um, uh, work on. Um, so that the examiner, as well as it'll be a reminder for the pupil as well, but it, primary for the examiner to know what it is in this next little chunk of learning, this next chunk of activity, are we trying to address so that it's all clear? Uh, it's no good it being obvious to the pupil and obvious to you, but not to the to the, to the examiner. Uh, you need to bear that in mind. You need to keep him in the loop as well so he knows what's going on. Um, the PDI, ADI should help the learner to achieve this within the time remaining. So you've got 40 minutes, basically, um, and you would probably break the 40 minutes into no more than four or five learning chunks, um, uh, with the last being the drive back to the test centre. So the last chunk that you would deliver as, as part, far as this test is concerned, would be the drive back to the center. So you need to be aware of the time and you need to know how far you are away from the test center so that you know when to stop what you're doing, have a quick review, talk to the thing, say, right, because of the time, it's now time for us to make our way back to the test center. On the way back, this is what we'll be uh, working on or achieving or attempting, whatever it is that you're trying to, to do on the way back. Um, put into practice possibly what we've already done um, uh, as we drive, make our way back to the test centre. So that's that would be a last learning chunk, um, making sure that you got there in plenty of time. Um, at the end, you do have a, what we, a, a two minutes for a quick reflection, which really should just focus on the, the last thing that you did, more or less, and, and possibly uh, overall. But it really has to be very short and two minutes long. You can actually do the, a proper, uh, you know, end of lesson procedure once the examiner has parted. So that's how we saw it. So if you look at each aspect of um, operating the, an LDC and driving lesson structure, you have a beginning, of course, you have a middle, and you have an end. That's how we how we look at um, how we look at lessons. Um, based on the beginning. Um, and the lesson format just outlined, um, you can use the LD system just as normally because you're going to start the lesson before you actually get to the test center. So everything that you normally do with the workbook, um, you, you can still do that. Um, and then you would actually start the lesson. Um, uh, depending on how much time you had, you would either start the lesson with a route that makes it makes you uh, direct, gets you to the test center. Or if you've got a little bit more time, maybe you'd be doing a bit more but you need to get to the test center area as soon as possible so that you, you can get, start to get familiar and work in that particular area. Uh, once at the test center, as we've said before, you answer the examiner's questions, you briefly recap where you are and what you plan to do next and away you go. And then you're into what we call the middle of the lesson. This is where you have a series of mini goals or uh, learning um, needs that you address uh, in small chunks, uh, secular time particular type um, cycles. So the difference here um, from, uh, which is highlighted in red, by the way, the reason why some of the text is red is, is to highlight what difference there is from what we would normally teach, is that you would probably rely more heavily on traditional instructional support skills and the applications of core comps rather than progressing via small, easy steps, structured discovery learning exercises using coaching alone. Um, you can potentially mix the two, as you'll see when we go through. But really, if you're a beginning of PDI, you, you certainly want to uh, keep really to the more traditional approach rather than the coaching approach. The goals will potentially be more about identifying learning de needs, which undoubtedly more often not are driving faults in some shape or form, um, uh, using 
a structural support to address them. So normally you would actually um, point out what the problem was and then um, you would actually give them support to actually make sure they um, overcome the problem next time and then you'd reduce that support um, over a period of time. That would be the, the, the more traditional way of, of, of doing, doing driving lessons. Uh, at the end of the lesson, the examiner, you've only got two or three minutes. Uh, so straight away, uh, you've got to be back by the 40 minutes and you've only got two or three minutes to when the lesson in the way and it talks about. So the full end of lesson procedure will be completed after the exam had left. So that's that's what the typical lesson structure, how it would, would change. Um, the beginning of the lesson, In the beginning of the lesson, let's have a look at each of the step, uh, sections in, in more detail. The beginning, lesson beginning. So you check to see how they were feeling as normal and, and they're looking forward to the lesson, collect any payment due, unless you do it at the end of the lesson, it depends on which way you prefer to do it. You discuss the student's reflection of the last lesson. Hopefully they've put that in the workbook and any plans or goals for this one and any other preparation practice that they might have undertaken. So that's just standard what you would norm, normally do. As, uh, as part of using the LD system. Um, alternatively, you would explore what they might want to cover today based on a recap of the last lesson and any provisional plan that they said or discussed at the end of the lesson, bearing in mind that, the, that it, you're at the test center location. So because of this slight peculiarity that you're gonna be working around the test center, um, you do need to uh, make sure that, you, you, if you like, the lesson before the lesson of your test does tie in with this particular uh, lesson as well, to a large extent. So it's a natural step, a natural progression from where you were uh, previously. Um, which targets were achieved, if not marked at the end of the last lesson, um, you might do that at that point. And then based upon the above, based upon what you've learned, you would actually establish a, 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 a viable plan of action by considering what lesson topic or topics do their learning goals or needs relate to, um, which abilities do they need, want to develop, improve, and to what degree? For example, what lesson targets are outstanding and or what personalised learning goals have they identified? What learning activities, learning, I thought it's six C learning steps and tasks for ideas in the workbook, might they want or need to perform in pursuit of their learning goals or the needs you have identified for them at the start or you suspect might arise later because obviously you need to be thinking ahead of, of what um, learning needs um, what issues might arise so that you can think about how you might deal with them should they arise on the actual test lesson and um, what type of area location routes would be suitable for these activities naturally that are close to the test centers because that's 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 where the test is and in light of the above you might structure the lesson, how you might structure the lesson and progress it, particularly uh, if you need to, if you find that your student struggles, you might need to find somewhere that's easier to deal with. If, if this student progresses more quickly than expected, you might find that you need something more challenging in the same area. So you need to look at being able to go retrospectively or move forward with the lesson as well as part of the, the overall plan. So that's that's how we, if you like, it relates to the lesson beginning. Um, then if you look at the lesson middle, we normally say that you do this in small little chunks of learning. Um, there's normally a goal, you do something, you reflect on it. Um, and as a result of that, you either change the goal or you identify a learning need, which could be a driving fault, which then becomes a goal for the next time around and so on. Um, they can increase or reduce in difficulty because you can change the challenge of the route or the activity that they're doing, um, which is normally what you do with coaching. However, um, uh, another way in which you can actually increase or decrease the difficulty of doing some sort of activity is by the level of support that you provide. You know, uh, everything from full talk through right the way to uh, Q&A can be used as a way of simplifying or making the task easier to perform. Um, as we say here, as Mr. mentioned before, you need short repetitive routes 
are often ideal for this type of learning, allowing the learner to experience the activity again and again within a short space of time so they don't have to drive for a long distance to go back and experience whatever it is that you're trying to deal with at, at, at this particular point. With the occasional review and reflection, until they have fully achieved their performance level, they want to in respect to the goal they set of learning need uncovered. Um, reminding you again, the final chunk would be the drive back. So whatever you're planning, the way you're structuring your lesson, do remember that you've got this little exercise at the end, which is to drive back to the test center. That has to be factored into your, into your driving lesson. So how does GROW fit in with this if you're using a coaching approach? Well, um, I'll just quickly remind everybody of what GROW is. Being a coach is about actively listening to your students, following their interests, questioning, clarifying, and summarizing to help them better define what they want to achieve next, i.e. the learning goal or the need identified, and stab establish why it is important, relevant for them to achieve it next. Is it safety critical, for example? How will they know when it's been achieved? In other words, um, how can you measure success? Uh, whether it can realistically be attained from their starting point. So if the goal or whatever you're trying to achieve is too big a step, then you need to break it down into potentially smaller steps. And or you can just increase your level of support as, a, as another alternative to reducing the challenge. Um, discover what is preventing them from realizing the goal. I mean, what are they lacking, if you like, knowledge, understanding, skill, or belief in themselves? But remember, with coaching, you're trying to get the student to recognize their lack of knowledge, understanding, or skill, um, um, or indeed their current emotional or physical state. All of these will act as obstacles towards being able to achieve a particular learning objective. And um, discover what op options they have to overcome the obstacles. Um, we mentioned it earlier, really, which is really you can either increase, decrease the challenge or you can increase or decrease the support that you provide. Um, you know, um, when I say increase or decrease the challenge, you can completely change it as well, of course. You can go and do something completely different to what you plan to do, if that was the appropriate thing to do. Explore, and that's called adapting the lesson for those of you that are not aware of it already. Explore how they might best apply themselves in this course, the way forward. In other words, what activity route or exercise uh, would most suit their purpose to develop whatever it is that they're trying to develop or overcome whatever deficiency they're trying to overcome at that point in time. Establish whether they will make it happen. Is it really what, are they committed? Are they sufficiently motivated? So, you know, have, have you got the buying from them? <laughs> do they actually, do they want to do this? Or is it just you that wants to do it? If it's just you that wants to do it, then don't be surprised if, if um, they're a little bit half-hearted uh, when they actually go around to trying to achieve whatever it is that basically you decided that uh, they, they need to achieve. Um, so, in other words, what you're going to do is develop a personal action plan or a specific activity, task, exercise, whatever you want to call it, to undertake, and the review process in pursuit of their learning goal or any learning needs identified. Undertake the activity. Then you reflect on the outcome, either on the move if possible. Again, the red um, uh, text is highlighting um, more what we need to emphasize for this particular test, or stationary and repeat. So let's have a look at the activity or the, the, the lesson middle, um, or lesson step, whatever you want to call it. So have the the student decide upon some practical learning activity in pursuit of their learning goals or needs you identify. What is the purpose, in other words? What, what is the purpose of whatever it is we're just about to do? There must be some, some reason for doing it um, that is actually going to hopefully progress uh, the development of the, the, the learner driver. Make sure any activity is within their capabilities, um, which is like the reality stage of the GROW model. Otherwise, encourage a learner to reduce the size of the step by making it simpler, easier, less risky, or breaking it down into several smaller component steps, or if necessary, by simply giving more uh, learning support to ease the task. Um, if you're using a more traditional approach, then uh, that's what you would do. You'd concentrate more on 
um, and giving more learning support uh, and gradually then reducing that learning support to hand over responsibility back to the student for responsibility as a student. Clarify who will be doing what before they start or resume the learning activity. So whatever we're going to do, who's going to be responsible for particularly in respect to, to risk, you know, um, I, I, are they taking full responsibility for it or are you taking part responsibility for it? So that needs to be clear on every little activity that, 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 you, uh, that you go through. Have them experience the activity as independently as possible. The reason for the blue is because the blue is very much about a, a coaching ideal. The red is the more traditional ideal. Um, unless you have to intervene to prevent the driving fault, which even if you're coaching, that still is an important aspect of what you need to do or to do, do, discuss the occurrence of a driving fault or unless instructional support in its various forms was considered necessary as part of the activity. So if as part of the activity or step you decided between the pair of you that you were going to support them in some way, then that's that's okay as well. That's a more traditional approach. It, it, in some ways, it is easier for the examiner to see as well whether learning is taking place because he can see that by the fact that every time you do a particular thing, he can see that you're reducing the level of support. So his natural inclination is to assume that you, uh, the student is making an improvement and learning is taking place. So that, that there is the advantage of using the, the more traditional transfer of responsibilities. It's, it's uh, also known. Have them reflect on the experience and or driving fault intervention that occurred. Um, when we say driving fault intervention occurred, you could say that's a learning opportunity or indeed a learning need. Pull over for a review using the coaching intervention or the old core comps approach. Um, uh, of course, again, the red meaning that's more traditional. Um, doing it on the move for all point possible. Again, that was a much more traditional approach. We always like to keep things moving and uh, try to uh, minimize the amount of time that, that you were stood stationary before they repeat the exercise with any necessary support from you. So um, what do you think should happen next in light of the ref ref reflection review? Do they have a goal or plan? If so, potentially let them uh, get on with it. If not, suggest the next course of action. So this is going back to the original slides that we used to do with how to use the LD system, how to give driving lessons. This is how it varies, uh, taking into account um, the differences um, with the test. As it says here, um, uh, should we make the changes to the lesson middle previously item in red? Well, should we introduce a more directive, um, a more directive instructional support as a key element or any goal or coaching conversation reflection review or would that be a backward step well we've decided it's not a backward step should we go uh, especially for the test or the standards check should we go back to the additional teaching techniques or full instruction on the first attempt partial instruction on the next attempt prompting and or q a on the next attempt and finally unaided practice well we generally said yes but it's not as, as fixed as, as it suggests there, in that you, you would have to make the decision whether you would need to uh, utilize full instruction on anything that was completely new to a student or not. But some form of support with the ultimate uh, uh, intention of, of removing it is more or less what everybody agreed on. So it didn't strictly have to follow this pattern, but it, it's typically where you would go. If they need a lot of support, it would be full instruction. If they need a little support, it would be prompting and or Q&A. Um, so as, a, as it says, as an alternative to undertaking, um, uh, uh, just gradually increasing the level of challenge, um, utilizing the instructional support as a means to measure progress. But what if safety critical is arose, or what if you could prevent the fault from occurring? Well, you should simple answer is yes, you should obviously do that. Um, we've always said that. Um, this is the again from the uh instructor train uh, from the course on, on using the LD system. This slide again is showing you as you're going along each of these chunks, and then during the activity, a serious fault occurs. Then we go into uh the core comps. Um, 
So we only interrupt the main learning development if you have to intervene to prevent a driving fault or to discuss the occurrence of a driving fault, either on the move or stationary, depending on circumstances. So even though we're ideally you want to do it on the move, as was when we spoke to um, uh, Willie Davis, um, he was quite happy that sometimes it would make sense to stop and you're not going to get penalised for that as long as you don't do it repetitively and as long as it doesn't consume masses amount of time you stood at the side of the road, it's not going to um, cause you to 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 um, fail either your standards check or your part three tests. So don't be too hung up on not stopping. You know, if you feel, if the if it instincts tell you you need to do it because it's too complicated to look at this in any other way, then just do it. But don't mess around. Focus very quickly on what it is you're trying to get across to the student and then get immediate, as fast as possible, get back on the road. And that's how they, how that's what they want to see. So, the guardian safety role is always in plan B in the background for most of the time. So you can see it's really the guardian safety role that the DBSA are, are really focusing on to a, a large extent. So um, now we've looked at how we would change, you know, how we would deliver an LD lesson um, using some of the old slides that we used originally. Um, when we were teaching how to, to utilise the LD system and give a driving lesson. Let's look now at the, the new standards check itself and the 17 competencies and, and see how the old core comps of fault identification, stroke prevention, analysis, remedial action relate to these uh, 17 competencies um, that are on part three in the standards check. So this is the old um, core competencies process. Um, I know uh, obviously the new PDIs are not trained on this, so it, well, it might be a little bit alien to you, um, but I'm sure you've watched the video where um, Bob said, look, see, say, suss it, sort it. That's what we mean by the, the old core competencies. It's basically fault identification and or prevention. Um, prevention is better than cure from the DBSA's point of view. So if you can feel you can stop somebody making a driving fault, then that's what you should do rather than allow them to make the driving fault and then um, discuss it afterwards. If that is at all possible, it's not always possible. So that, that's it. Um, fault analysis, um, sorry, fault identification. You've got to say it. So you've got to make it clear that you've seen it both for the benefit of the examiner in the back. So he knows that, that you've seen it. Um, if you can't talk about it right at that moment, just signpost it, say, look, I want you just to remember what happened there, because uh, we need to talk a bit more about that a bit later on. Um, because if there's too much going on at that moment in time, then maybe you can't actually start discussing it right away. So, um, you know, you see it, you said it, you made the examiner aware that you spotted something and you're going to talk about it. If if not straight away, you're going to talk about it very shortly. Um, so um, that's the informing the pupil bit. Um, then we look at um, what's called the fault analysis. In other words, what happened and why did it happen? You know, in other words, if, if you're from a coaching point of view, it's what obstacles stopped you, uh, prevented you from achieving your learning goal, basically, or your learning objective, um, uh, or what caused the driving fault. Um, why is it a problem? In other words, why do we need to deal with it so that we can make sure that the student recognises why it's important to look at doing something about this, uh, which is what that's all about. Then you've got, we've got into something called remedial action, which is where you go to sort it. So um, having, once you've decided why it's happened, um, you know, what caused it, what you, what you can do to solve it, um, you then talk about a plan of action to, to prevent it from happening again, basically. And in the, the olden days, that typically would, depending if they were partly trained or full license holder, it would mean that you'd usually give them full instruction, but only on the, the new stuff, the thing that was actually at fault, not not any of the other stuff that they're doing, just the, the, the thing that they're doing, um, with a view to then reducing that to prompts or Q, some q and instead. Then you'd be quiet, shut up, and then you'd give them feedback, say, well done, that's good. Did you realise you actually did it that time without any support or any help from me? Um, boo -hoo. So that's that. That's the the the, the traditional um, 
like the way of using the core competencies and the remedial uh, remedial action. So, however, if we're using it in a client centers way, then you need to make sure the student is more actively involved in this process and there's less judgmental language. So you can avoid the, the word false mistakes, then that would be fantastic. If you can't, then you can't, it doesn't really matter. Um, so a fault is a perhaps better reframed as a learning opportunity or indeed a learning uh, need that you've identified, identified which uh, for further or future development. So that's a better way of, uh, of imagining it. So if we look at how this um, would work, if we were to compare it to the, the new core competencies, then first of all, did you spot or prevent the fault? Straight away, you can see that that would be, were you aware of your surroundings and actions? In other words, if you're not aware of what's going on either with the students, so you, you need to keep an eye on what the student's doing, but you also need to keep an eye on what's going on around you. So if you haven't done that, then straight away, um, that's going to affect uh, you. Well, you're not going to be able to identify it in the first place. You're certainly not going to prevent it. So you're not going to intervene timely or appropriately um, uh, in informing the pupil as well. So that's, if you like, straight away where um, you've got some connection between the old core competencies and, and the new competencies. Then you've got the fault analysis. Did you, this? in fact, we flip right over to one of the training learning strategies, which is encouraged to analyze problems and take responsibility. As I said, because it's client-centered, then what you're trying to do here is you're trying to involve the student more uh, and to take responsibility. So you start by asking them, were they aware of what had happened? Did they know why it happened? Did they realize that it was a driving fault or didn't they? Um, you always give them the opportunity to express, give them the opportunity to, to, to let you know what it was if they do. Obviously, if they don't, then you still need to give them the feedback. You still need to tell them. Um, so if they figure it out for themselves, because of the questions that you ask, great. If not, then tell them. Um, uh, help them understand why it's a safety critical incident. Again, you might be able to get them to tell you why it's a safety critical incident, uh, uh, which is even better, certainly because you effectively use Q&A rather than telling what, yourself why it's a safety critical incident. But if they, if they can't figure it out, then naturally you have to tell them. Be careful if anything that you do tell them is absolutely technically correct. Because if you technically give any false information to the examiner, then that's likely to lead you um, to fail the exam. Because the examiner will simply think, well, the person doesn't even know the highway code rules. So it doesn't really matter what else you do as part of that test. Once you start showing that you're ignorant of the information that you need to have as an expert, then you, you're going to fall straight under that. So as part of discussing that, hopefully you will give accurate information following that there may be queries i like questions from the student which again you need to answer in an appropriate way and you've got to be welcoming the way in which you do it because remember we're client centered so we're not going to be annoyed that they're asking questions we're going to be grateful for the opportunity to explore the questions that they they have about this to help boost and increase their understanding um so um that's why you would Queries would potentially come in. Um, they could also come in at the next stage where we talk about remedial action. Mm -hmm. So, in the light of that, the next thing is now to really identify a new student goal and or a need. Um, it's basically a learning need if you've identified a gap in their knowledge, understanding, or the skill or their self confidence. That is effectively a learning need that you've identified. Now, if that's just a part of still achieving the same learning goal, then you don't need to change the goal. The goal's the same. What you need to do is address the need that you've identified, which is that they're weak in a particular area. So we're going to do, we're still working towards the same goal, but we're going to address that particular need. So that's how that, that particular, uh, that's how that works. Um, so as a consequence of that, the, the lesson plan will be adapted in some way. If you know of a way, because you've actually got new student goals and or needs, so uh, you have changed that. Now, if that those new goals or needs that have been identified need a radical rethink of the lesson, 
then you might need to completely change the lesson structure in the plan. You might need to change what you were planning to do because you've now realized that something else um, is more important, perhaps a subskill that's not in place that needs to be in place. So we're going to really have to direct our attention towards that. So you might change the plan as a consequence of that. And then you might even might need to change the practice area or at least the route. You're a bit stuck with the area, you're in the area of the test center. So um, it's, it's the route or the street that you, you, you would change. Um, and that's why those two are listed as part of the remedial action. Then when you're going to do whatever it is you're going to do next, you need to share responsibility. Who's responsibility for risk? This is where you would be talking about the level of um, support that you were giving or the change in the activity uh, and who was going to do what. Um, so that's where that, that, that comes into being. Who's responsible for what? Why are we going to go out and do something to, to resolve this issue? Um, when you start to do the, uh, when you start to actually solve the problem, uh, go out, correct the fault, improve, make the change, uh, uh, then you've got to give clear instructions and directions. So straight away, that's where that kind of going to come in. You could have obviously hit that. You could be making mistakes in that area even before you got to the fault identification. But if we're looking at it as a cycle, um, and then you can see where it most likely would come in is when you actually decided to do something. You found something, you set a goal, you set a, a, a learning um, a learning need. Now you're going to do something about it. This doing something about it is some sort of practical exercise. So it is important that uh, if you're using instructions, they're clear uh, and directions. Um, that then looks at teaching style. Does it suit the learner? Is it what they want? Um, are they happy for you to either give the level of instruction that you're giving? Because if you're over instruction, for example, and, and the student's feeling quite resentful towards you because you're saying, yeah, I know why you're treating me like a baby, then obviously you're, you're, not, you're not matching the teaching style to the pupil's needs, basically. So that's that comes into there. The way you treat the pupil, the attitude, especially as you're driving along, you may see things happen um, and you need to be professional. You know, if a student does something wrong, there's no tutting and going, because <sighs> that's considered completely unprofessional and, and it's quite discriminatory. If you start talking about female drivers or any other types of drivers, then straight away you're into this area where you, you, you're being discriminatory, not using bad language, um, and being over familiar, invading their space. All those things would go into to, to this. So as you're now doing the, the task, doing the next chunk of learning, then all these things can obviously come into being. Um, then as you achieve things, particularly as, as, as you um, doing it just to make sure the student is always on track and knows the outcome that you're trying to achieve, you would actually sometimes use examples to try to re reinforce that. And then at the end, you'd obviously be giving them hopefully feedback, praise, because they'd actually solved the issue. So that's how the two work to, to uh, work together and, and why they're quite important. You can see now how they're all sort of interconnected as well. Uh, so if you look at remedial action, at this point in the cycle, do we go back to coaching? This is one of the questions that you'd have to ask yourself. Um, to turn the needs identified into a goal to aim for, with unaided support, trusting the student to resolve the matter for themselves as a result of the increased awareness of the situation? Or do you follow the more traditional approach of the support route where you give them um, a certain amount of support to make sure they don't repeat the, the, the problem, at least on the next attempt, and then quickly decide uh, to reduce that support um, so that they become independent as quickly as possible? So you have to decide which of the two approaches you would want. Um, the examiners would naturally be more comfortable with the one with the instruction because they can see what's happening easier. Whereas if you're relying on the student to sort out, uh, figure it out for themselves and sort out their own problem, which I know we, those who do coaching realize that it does and it can happen. It's invisible to the 
examine it because it's actually happening the science student said. Whereas if you're actually supporting them and then reducing that support, it's much more visible and easy to see. So just saying, I'm not to, not saying that you shouldn't. Um, it should really depend on the student circumstances. The old core comps does still provide a useful tool for modern instructors, provided it's in, implemented in a positive client-centered way with the learner's active involvement input using a combination of teaching, i.e. directive, or learning, i.e. non-directive strategies as the instructor and the learner feel is more appropriate for them and the circumstances that prevail. So that's more or less what, what we came to thinking. Um, looking at it another way, um, courtesy, th th these slides are courtesy of Bob, which is if you look at the old core competencies, this might make more sense to you looking at it this way. Um, see, say, sussy, and sort it. Well, here we go. You've got you've got the you've got the 17 competencies. Let's see what happens as we go around the core comp cycle. First of all, see what happens if you don't see. Well, straight away, was the trainer aware of the surroundings of the pupil's actions? Clearly not, because they didn't see it and didn't recognize it. There was no way of the examiner being able to pick up on the fact that you had seen it. So um, we know that in coaching, sometimes you think, well, I'll, I'll ignore the fault because it would be useful to talk about it later. Well, <laughs> yeah, you don't do that because that just looks like to the examiner that you've not seen it. So you've got to make sure you see it because if you see it, you then got to say it. If you don't say it, there was any verbal or physical intervention by the learner time inappropriate. So you've either say something to prevent the fault or you say something shortly after the fault so that uh, the examiner is aware that you're aware of it. You pointed it out to the student or you've at least made him aware so he needs to remember something so that we can talk about it later. Um, that immediately then goes on to the um, sussy side. Um, you know, what's sufficient feedback given uh, to help the pupil understand any uh, potentially safety critical incident? This is, did he understand what caused it? Did he understand why it was important not to repeat it or not to do that? You know, that's simply what that means. So straight away, you can see it it hits, hits there. Um, now, because of that, because you've you found it, you've spotted it, you've talked about it, you now have to adapt the lesson. Um, you now have to introduce either a new learning need or even a new goal, depending on how 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 big a problem that you, you've come across. So there's now we're adapting the lesson in some shape or form, increasing, reducing support, increasing or reducing the challenge in some way. Um, um, or completely changing the, what, what we're doing altogether, depending on how serious the problem or issue was. So straight away, that hits the uh, adapting the lesson, which incidentally, as the DVSA will tell you, that is the main reason for people failing their part three and their standards check, is that they're not adapting the letter, lesson. Um, they're letting things go and they're not doing anything about them, basically. Um, so it now revolves back around again. Did the lesson identify the uh, So at least out of this, you've either identified a, a, a learning need, i.e. there's some aspect of, of what they're doing needs uh, needs improving, which may be towards the same learning goal that we've already established, or it could be a complete change goal altogether. Um, so yes, immediately it's going to impact there. So even if at the start you did a fantastic session on what uh, what we're going to do today <laughs> then it's now completely blown out of the water uh, simply because you you haven't actually adapted to the need or the new goal um, that you've identified or that you should have identified or you should have got the student to recognize and make part of the, the training session um, which can also then it could potentially impact on the structure and it could also uh, impact on uh, the practice area because either of those things might need to be changed as well um in, uh, so let's for a moment assume that that's not the case but it does as you also realize from the the earlier slide that i did 
it also impinges straight away on many of these teaching and learning strategies. So straight away, you're going to get marked down in those areas as well. Um, so from this, you can see straight away, you've got how many boxes? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten boxes. Straight away, you could be down 30 points. So you're going to fail. Um, and you're certainly not going to get an A or a B. So that's why it's so critical. So you can see from that, the, the, all the competencies are in a way interconnected. Um, so where are the 17 competencies? As you can see, um, you've got the learning goals and needs. You've got the structure, the plan for the lesson, if you like. You've got the practice area. Then that links naturally straight into the risk management because normally who's responsible for it. So any learning activity, it needs to be clear who's going to be responsible for what aspect of this next exercise that we're about to undertake um, and so on. Um, you know, so, you know, you then have to make sure that your directions and your instructions are clearly understood and timed properly, et cetera. Um, you've got to be able to keep an eye both on what's happening around you and the student so that you see what's going on. Because without that, you're not going to be able to spot any faults, for example. Um, if, if you can see potential danger ahead and you don't think the student's perhaps able to deal with it, if you've got the time, you might ask them a question just to test that. Because you might not need to, to intervene, but uh, depending on the response, you might then decide, yes, I do need to intervene, either with some clear instruction. Or if it happens too late and you haven't got the time, you might even have to physically intervene. So that's why that's there. And then if you've if if you've hit those, if you've hit four, then you're going to hit five because now you're going to have to give them some feedback. You know, if there was some physical intervention or verbal intervention, it's quite clear you need to give them some feedback as to why that was. You know, um, and as as we said before, that straight away drops across to most of the teaching uh, and learning strategies as well. So they're all interconnected. Um, if there's a clear safety need, then that can straight away trigger the need to adapt the lesson. Um, otherwise, it's more often than not, it's, it's learning needs, uh, which come through this area that you've identified that require an adaption. The adaption then results in a new learning goal and or uh, learning needs, one or the other, which may then result in a structural change, may result in a change in the practice area, and then we're back round again with enough more activity. So I hope that gives you uh, a good idea as to how we see, see it working. So that brings us to the lesson end section. Now, remember, we've only got two minutes for this lesson end section. So you try to end on a high note if at all possible. Um, check to see if they have any questions before you end the lesson. Ask them how they felt the lesson went and give them some inspiring feedback about their performance. And that's where you would stop. And then it would be back over to the examiner. Thank you very much. I'm just going to disappear for a minute. Think about it. And then I'm going to come back and give you a result. Comes back, gives you the result. Obviously, you'll all get an A, so that would be fantastic. And then you can complete the real end of lesson, as we would talk about uh, uh, where, you know, in respect to doing driving lessons uh, the LDC way. So you'd ask them what they might like to do next, a provisional plan, it's in the workbook. Um, all these things are in the workbook. Encourage them to give it some more thought between now and when you next meet. So you encourage them to do a reflection before you next meet, if, if, you, can, if you can get them to do that. If not, you can do a quick reflection when you next meet them verbally. Um, get them to update the lesson targets if you haven't already updated the lesson targets or update them now. It depends on how you prefer to operate the LD system. And then try to encourage them to make a plan for the next lesson, you know, to come up with a goal, ideally, uh, and what lesson topic they'd like to cover. Um, again, if they don't, then it means that you'll just have to do a verbal reflection and then uh, a verbal plan um, and uh, uh, ready for, for your, your lesson. But you'd ask similar sort of questions to what's, what's in the workbook. Um, and then... Uh, consider doing any preparation research that might help. So depending on what the provisional plan is, you might say, well, I think you'd find it useful to watch this 
video in section whatever or read this section before we next meet in other words um uh, suggest some potential homework that might be useful to them or in fact if you're working with mum and dad you might might be encouraging them to continue with the practice with mum and dad then all depends on how, on how you operate so that's really takes us to the end so to summarize Carefully think well in advance about the topics and all the skills development that might best be suited to the practice areas around the test center or indeed en route to it. Um, start the lesson before you arrive at, at the test center. It could be 30 minutes early, it might be 15 minutes, it could even be an hour. It depends how, uh, although an hour would probably be a bit too much for, for the student. The student's going to be a bit tired out by then. So um, I don't think any more than 30 minutes would be a good idea and do a, a, a review, a reflection with your learner before the examiner gets in the car so that you've got everything sorted. Uh, briefly recap what the student hoped to achieve at the, at the start of the lesson and where they are now in respect to the lesson goals set or the new needs identified and what you now intend to move on to in the next 40, 40 minutes, but more particularly what you're gonna do in the next step, in the next chunk. You know, again, what's the purpose? Uh, what is the goal? What is the learning need that we're addressing? You know, um, consider using a more traditional directive instructional old core comps approach, but more client centered, as we discussed, rather than coaching non directive approach, because there's too much silence with and, and a non direct coaching non directive approach. Plus, um, to have a reasonable conversation, more often than not, you have to be stationary. Um, this does not um, bode well as far as the DVSA is concerned because they're more, much more interested in can you keep the student safe when you're on the road driving in busier time traffic situations. So that's really what they're uh, mainly interested in seeing that you keep control of that lesson um, and still enable learning to happen despite the fact that you're on the move all the time and lots of things going on around you. Um, I've said, unless you're highly accomplished in this regard and keep the examiner on board with what you are doing, well, I can tell you from personal experience, I know a few people who are really good at coaching and have struggled <laughs> to get a grade A on the standards check, partly because of it, um, you know, partly because they allowed faults to appear to go unnoticed. They did, they did come out eventually, but the examiner would have been happy for them to come out or be prevented in the first place, um, for example, is one of the areas where you fall out. And the other dif the difficulty is when you're letting the experience be the teacher, principally, in other words, they're learning themselves because of the experience that they're having and you're just there to keep them safe. And you've engineered it, of course, you've set up the structured experience. You've made sure the challenge or the step or the route is just a little bit, this is going to stretch them a little bit more um, so, yeah, if, if you're a coach, then yes, you are still heavily involved in the success of that, that student's learning. But that is very difficult to see from the back seat, from the examiner's perspective. So that's why it's wiser to use a more traditional approach. Make sure you know the area around your test centre and make the last chunk of learning the drive back, as we said before. So, you know, figure out how you're going to get that in. Make sure your student will be comfortable driving in that area. You might need a couple of lessons beforehand in that area. So now it really depends on the circumstances, how far you have to travel, whether that is a possibility. Um, but that might help as well. And make sure that the student is at a level to cope with Q&A on the move. You know, because you need to have this dialogue with a student, ideally on the move. So if they're still at the level where, you know, if you say anything, it's going to just distract them completely and it's going to cause them to make mistakes, then, then that's not the right student. So normally, you're looking at it from the LDC, uh, uh, LD uh, system point of view, we're basically saying you need to have the control skills developed completely and well into the road skills developed, if, if not even some of the traffic skills, depending upon the practice areas near the test centre. So you're looking for a, what they would call a partly trained um, student, which is somebody with potentially as many as 20 hours under the belt, or a 
trained one, which is potentially somebody with as many as 30 hours in the belt, relatively close to the driving test, or a full licensed soldier who has not had much experience, has only been a full licensed soldier for a short period of time, could be somebody who's passed the test but is frightened to go into the city centre, for example, that could be a full licensed soldier who's, who's a relatively new licensed soldier but is not completely confident. Um, or it could be if they were trained by a PDI that maybe never went on a motorway, so they weren't interested in going on motorways. Or it could be a, a full try, uh, a license holder experience who is really looking to um, massively improve the quality of, the, of his driving, reduce perhaps fuel usage, um, uh, improve his defensive driving skills, keeping himself safe, um, which could be. Uh, a requirement for a job. There's a lot of, you know, so that's probably, you're probably in the area there where you're, you're talking, you know, more about fleet training um, for the, the full license holder experience. Of course, it brings with it its own problems because if they've been forced to go on the training course with you, then that is an interesting barrier that you're going to have to overcome as well. Um, so it's not necessarily the easiest choice. The examiner is going to expect you to work a lot harder at making improvements. And it is going to be a lot harder to make improvements with somebody that's experienced. So don't assume that a full license holder is in any way an easy touch because uh, in my experience or our experience, it, it's not. So make, finally, make sure you know how you might take a step backwards or indeed forwards. You'd like practice areas at your disposal in and around the test centre. You know, I can't emphasise this uh, more greatly with all the best will in the world, with all the best planning in the world, the student could just not perform on the day to their usual standards in, and, and you may and you'll need a backup plan. Alternatively, they might even completely surprise you and um, progress much more rapidly than you anticipated, in which case, what are you now going to do? So um, whichever direction it's in, you've got to think about that with the area in mind. So you've got to take all that into account to make sure that you give yourself that chance of getting the A, because that's what we like to see. We like to see first attempt at part three, A. That's all we're after. That's, if you're waiting for that, and then you get a B, at least you have passed. Um, if you're just looking at scraping through, doing the minimum you can possibly get away with, uh, and hope that you'll just get the magic number, then um, that's not there. That's not the way to look at it. It's best to try and be the best you can be. Um, uh, and then um, there's more chance that even if you have an off day, it will still will result in a positive result for you. So um, I think I've said as much as I should. So thank you for listening. Obviously, I can't ask you any questions because it's not actually um, a live uh, workshop meeting as, as, as we actually did originally back in uh, 2022 so thank you for listening i hope it's been useful um if you do have any queries you can always put them on, on a post uh yeah, on the facebook group uh, and i'll be happy to answer them as indeed will any of the other itc team members <laughs>